All right, so good evening, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? This sounds pretty good here. Um, okay, so the talk I'm going to do tonight is kind of geared more toward a beginning uh, a level of knowledge in astronomy, um, trying to, to gear it towards everyone. And what I want to be talking about tonight is kind of like why you're seeing what you're seeing at a, at a total solar eclipse, not so much what you're going to see or what to see it with. So tonight I'm going to make you think a little, I hope, and uh, I'm going to try to make it fun and entertaining. Um, and so hopefully you'll learn a little bit about uh, total solar eclipses and, and other solar eclipses, but with an emphasis, of course, on, the, on total solar eclipses. And just before I get started here, I want to make it known that almost all, maybe all of my diagrams are not to scale. So if you see a sun that's this size and a moon that's that size, not to scale, it's that way for clarity. Um, and so we're, we're going to, uh, just so you know that, uh, going forward. Okay. So uh, just a show of hands, how many of you out there have not seen a solar eclipse at all, any kind? Show of hands. Not very many of you, okay. How, how many of you out there have seen a total solar eclipse? Wow, okay. So, uh, of course, this is the astronomy club here. Um, a, a very small percentage of, of people uh, have seen a solar eclipse, let alone a total solar eclipse. So, if you ask somebody out on the street, chances are they won't have seen a, a solar eclipse of any kind. This is a rare event, especially a total solar eclipse. Um, very rare event. On average, a total solar eclipse is visible from any given point on Earth um, once every 350 years. So if you were to live a long time, 350 years, and stay on one spot on the Earth, chances are you would see an eclipse. Maybe not, but the chances are that you would see one. Um, it happens on average every 18 months somewhere on the Earth's surface. So this is modern day, you got travel, you know, if you've got the means to go around and chase these eclipses, you can see one on average uh, once every 18 months. And of course, you know, it's critical if you want to see the total solar eclipse, uh, you have to move toward that path of totality. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit about that later. Um, otherwise, you only see a partial eclipse, and those uh, partial eclipses are a little bit more common. And uh, just uh, before we move on, uh, I'd like to say that, you know, if you've got kids in school, um, by all means, get them out of school for five, ten, half an hour, uh, just to see this eclipse. Um, there's no telling if they're going to get out of school to see this or not, and this, this is going to be an awesome experience. Even here in Oklahoma City, where we have, like, I think it's 85% uh, here in Oklahoma City, give or take. It's going to be a really nice partial eclipse here, and just, I mean, it took a picture in a textbook to, to give me a lifelong love of astronomy. So um, just it, no telling what it takes for a kid, a spark, to, to get that love of astronomy and science going within, with kids. And if you're in, in work, too, just take off five, ten minutes, uh, whatever you can, go out and see it. And um, of course, if you can, get out and move toward the path of totality. Um, just get out there and see it. It's going to be awesome. So, all right. Occurrences of solar eclipses in the United States. Um, and this is a map of 2001 to 2050. And the blue lines here, those are the total solar eclipses. And this path here, this is the 2017 uh, total solar eclipse that we're going to see. Uh, if you miss that one, there's a couple more. There's one in 2024 going through here, and it cuts through the, kind of the southeastern corner of Oklahoma there. And also one in 2045 uh, right here. cuts through a, a pretty big swath of, of Oklahoma here. So there's some more coming up. These yellow lines here, those are annular eclipses. And we'll talk a little bit more about those later, uh, what they are and what they look like. Okay, all right. So what happens over a millennia if you live a really long time, a thousand years? So over a millennia, chances are if you're somewhere in the United States, you'll see a few eclipses. Um, this is a map done of all the different eclipses over the next thousand years. Unless you live here in Midland, Odessa, maybe Abilene there. <laughs> Out of luck. No eclipses. No eclipses for you. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know what, what's going on there, but. <laughs> okay, so why are, these, why are these total eclipses so rare? 
Um, there's four basic conditions needed for totality, and these are basic conditions. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of these in the next, in the next few slides. So number one, uh, there must be a new moon. You must have a new moon. The moon must pass through the ecliptic path. The moon must be near perigee. And number four, this is not needed for the eclipse to occur per se, but if you want to see it, you must be under the shadow of the moon. So our first item, uh, no, no moon, you're not going to have an eclipse. Um, this should be pretty obvious to most people. Um, at the new moon, the moon is between the earth and the sun. So you have what's called, those of you who like neat words, this is called a syzygy. And that's when there's two or more bodies in a line. So you have a syzygy going on here. S, S Y, Z, Y, G, Y. Good thing that wasn't handed to me on a spelling bee. Um, syzygy going on there. Uh, the August eclipse, something interesting here, the August eclipse uh, new moon will also hold the title of black moon. And I'm sure most of you have heard the term blue moon, once in a blue moon, meaning something that's rare. Uh, this one will be a black moon. And the definition of a black moon is the third new moon in a season with four new moons. So a season com is comprised of three months, right? So you have a new moon each season. Some seasons you have four new moons, and this is one of those seasons that we have four new moons. And this happens to be the third new moon in the four new moon season, so we have a black, a black moon. So that's kind of interesting, black moon eclipse. It's cool. Okay, moving right along. Okay, now this slide is probably the most hairy slide of my talk, so if you can get through this, uh, you got it made. Um, some of those, some, some of you, might have been wondering on the last slide, well, we got the syzygy, this, this, you know, the earth, the moon, and the sun all in a line. Why don't we have an eclipse every month? You know, we've got them in a line. Why don't we, get, why, why don't we have this eclipse happening all the time? The answer there is mostly because of this tilt in the moon's orbital plane here. You see this uh, yellow and red plane. Well, it's actually tilted. It's not just a flat uh, going around the Earth, it's actually at a tilt, at an angle like this, a five degree, roughly five degree tilt there. And what happens is that as the moon goes around this tilt, and the tilt also wobbles, so it's got this kind of wobbly thing going on. And you're, with this tilt, the moon's going up and down, and it's crossing the ecliptic plane, this blue and green checkered here. And the ecliptic plane is the plane at which you would imagine an imaginary line in, in the sky. Well, the ecliptic plane is where the, the sun, the, the imaginary line that the sun follows as it goes through the sky. So if you're not crossing that line, you're not going to have a, an eclipse. And you can see right here, the red dot, that is called a node. And that's actually where the moon is dipping down into that ecliptic plane. And, and you can see there, as it passes under that purple line, it's going to miss the sun. So most of the time, the moon, it'll either go too high or it'll go too low. It'll miss the sun. And it's just kind of like the sun's the target and you're trying to hit that target. Well, it, it misses the target. Okay, so the condition that you, you need is for those nodes. Node is a point in the moon's orbit that signals the moon crossing the ecliptic plane. So right there on that first example, it's not crossing the ecliptic plane. You're not going to get an eclipse. It's going too low. This one right here, down in the corner here, this is the condition needed for you to have an eclipse. As you can see, the, the nodes are in a line. They're lining up with the sun, the earth, and the moon. And they're all in a line. So you're crossing that ecliptic plane at the time when the sun and the earth are together in the moon. And that brings about what's called an eclipse season. And these occur twice a year uh, when the nodes along the orbital plane of the moon, the red dots, they align themselves more or less with the earth and the sun. And this is, it's got a tolerance to it of about 31 to 37 days there. So you have a 31 to 37 day window when eclipses are possible, and that's called an eclipse season. It's when that moon's orbital plane is in just the right spot. Um, so you can see here in this picture, the moon is in position right now for a total solar, a solar eclipse, a total there. Um, if it were just a little bit past and then all of a sudden you, you, you were eligible for an eclipse season, it would have to go around, you know, say the moon orbits the Earth every 20, roughly 28 days. 
So it would have to go around, you'd get a lunar eclipse there at this far node and you'd be coming around, you know, in the 20, 22nd, 23rd, 24th day, finally you'd get a solar eclipse. And once you're past that node there, you know, you're running out of time, you wouldn't be eligible for another eclipse as it comes back here to the, the lunar eclipse point. But I've got an animation here that maybe will make that a little bit clearer. I know it's a little bit confusing. Okay. Sun's over here, and you'll see a red line in the middle as we tilt. That is the ecliptic plane. And watch what happens. So we've missed it. it again. But now the magic happens. It's just right and we get the eclipse there, the shadow on earth. So that is why that happens. <coughs> Thank you Goddard Space Flight Center for that wonderful animation. Okay, and these repeat every six months. So every six months you go into these eclipse seasons, you'll be eligible again for an eclipse. You can have uh, one to three eclipses within an eclipse season. Uh, to have three eclipses is, is rare, but uh, one to three eclipses. If you have questions, feel free to ask me at the, at the end of the, the presentation. Okay, our, our third item here. The moon must be near perigee, or its closest uh, approach to Earth on its elliptical orbit. And if you notice in that last animation, uh, the moon travels around the Earth in an elliptical orbit, not a circular orbit. So sometimes it's out here and it's further away, and then sometimes it's over here and it's closer. So what that does is that sometimes we get lucky and we get the moon near perigee when it's close and we get at that first illustration up there we get a total solar eclipse as you can see that distance there between the moon and the earth is small and so its shadow lands on the earth's surface and we get this wonderful total solar eclipse here if you're not near perigee or if you're near apogee that shadow will not hit the earth if you can see that second one there there's more distance between the earth and the moon and so that shadow doesn't hit the earth and you get what's called an annular eclipse. If, if you recall the, the, the slide in near the beginning with the yellow, the yellow pass, those are annular eclipses. And you'll see this. And it's got this, they're actually pretty spectacular. I've seen one of them before. It's got this fat ring of, of the sun around it, and, it's, and the moon, of course, is on the front. But it's simply because the moon's too far away, and so its shadow isn't big enough to cover the disk of the sun. Um, so this illustration down here is kind of nice too. So we have condition A, which is a total solar eclipse, and you can see the shadow down there under the A diagram, and that main shadow in the middle there is called the umbra, the umbra. That's where you want to be to see a total solar eclipse is in the umbra. Um, so condition B, you get an annular eclipse as we were talking about up there. So if you're within the light cone for the, uh, the annular eclipse, that's called the antumbra uh, for an annular solar eclipse. And of course, on both of them, if you're not within the umbras, you get in the penumbra. Um, that's where you'll see a partial solar eclipse. Uh, won't, be, won't be a total, won't be an annual, it'll be a partial. And so there's an, a third type that I didn't illustrate here called a hybrid uh, solar eclipse. And that's actually where, I'm gonna use, use my son's ball here. That's where you're not quite near perigee. You're, you're near it, but you're not near enough to have a total solar eclipse over the whole face of the Earth. What happens is that, act like this is the light cone, you get an annular solar eclipse here because the shadow isn't reaching, and as it gets toward the fat curvature of the Earth there, you get a total solar eclipse. But then you move out and you get another, you get an annular out here. So you can actually have three types of eclipses in one event, and that's called a hybrid eclipse. Okay, and delving a little bit deeper into that last concept uh, before we move on to the fourth ingredient, uh, how is it possible that the moon's disk and the sun's disk are the same size and they're able, the moon's able to cover up the sun? Well, the answer is the sun's angular diameter, the diameter of its disk is 400 times larger, but it's also 400 times farther away. So we get this wonderful coincidence that happens that allows us to see these wonderful total solar eclipses. 
And this is just an illustration here. We talked about elliptical orbits, okay? So when you're farther away on the elliptical orbit, the body will appear smaller. The, if it's the moon, the moon will appear smaller. If it's closer in, it'll appear larger. And the same thing with the sun. Um, so perigee and apogee and perihelion and, and aphelion there for the sun due to these, these elliptical orbits. Okay, and lastly, not a condition for the eclipse to happen per se, but if you want to be present under the shadow or the, the umbra, I'm trying to make this mem memorable here. If you want to see it, you must be under the umbra of the eclipse uh, to see totality, else you will have a partial solar eclipse uh, like the one shown down here. Uh, you'll be under the penumbra. Uh, and partial solar eclipses can be very spectacular, but they're not like total solar eclipses. So if you can, get around and see the total. If not, partial solar eclipses are still pretty awesome. Okay, so the next part of my uh, talk here, yeah, kids and dogs. I like the little boy with the, the, the sunglasses, the glasses on his bear watching the eclipse. I'm going to talk about the 2017 total solar eclipse uh, in particular, a little emphasis on, on this, uh, this eclipse. So let's look at something cool here. Okay, so this is a map chart of the path of the 2017 total solar eclipse. And it's really cool. This is, you can find this on the NASA site, uh, nasa.gov. And it's really awesome because you can drop a pen anywhere and it will tell you a lot of useful information. It'll tell you the start, it'll tell you the maximum eclipse, the end of the eclipse, it'll tell you how much obscuration you have, 84.11 here in the spot in Oklahoma City, uh, whether it's a partial or a total, and the magnitude. So there's a lot of information in here. Um, the path of totality happens within these, these two blue lines here, and the red line here is the center line. Um, so if you're within those two blue lines, you will have a total solar eclipse, 100% obscuration. Down here, there's two points called GD and GE. So GD, uh, greatest duration. So this is the point at which the eclipse is going to last the longest. And you can see two minutes, 40.2 seconds here. Move up the line a bit into Wyoming here. Two minutes, 26.1 seconds. Not a whole lot of difference, and that's a long ways away. Um, but that is the calculated point of greatest duration. You will see the eclipse the absolute longest. Greatest eclipse, GE, that's the point where the shadow of the moon is closest to the Earth. So you will get the biggest, roundest shadow there. There's more, the, the most shadow is covering the Earth at greatest eclipse. GE and GD are usually uh, pretty close together. All right. Rebecca, yes? Why aren't they the same? It seems like the biggest shadow would have the longest duration. Good question. Yeah, so there's, there's a, a lot of things that are a part of GD, uh, the GD calculation. The main thing that goes into that, why they're different, is, nor is mainly because of elevation differences in the curvature of the Earth cause that to be separated out. It's, it's actually quite complex, but the main contributing factor to that is, is elevation in the, in the Earth's surface. Okay, moving right along. All right, some questions about the eclipse path map. Um, why does the eclipse path have that curve to it? Um, the answer is, so you're projecting onto a sphere. If it was just a flat surface, a piece of paper, it would be a perfect line and a perfect circle uh, as, the, as, the, as the moon's shadow moves across. But you're projecting onto the Earth, which is a sphere. So what you have is this the shadow, when it hits the Earth, and it kind of does this because the Earth has bulged to it. So it's a sphere. 
And also, uh, to that effect, the shape, and you'll see, I've got some animations here, you'll see the shape of the shadow will change. It'll start out as an ellipse as it's further off the limb of the Earth there. It'll move into a perfect circle around GD and GE, and then it'll kind of turn into this ellipse again. And that's also due to the curvature. It's also due to the uh, geography of the moon. The moon's got this ragged edge to it, and it's exacerbated when it's put down as a shadow on the Earth. Um, so, oh, okay, well, let's delve into this too. Why does the shadow move west to east instead of east to west? Now, I didn't mention this, but it's true. It, it moves uh, west to east instead of east to west. And most of you, I'm sure, have looked at the moon, seen it rise in the, rise in the east and set in the west. Well, I'm here to tell you that's an illusion. It's an illusion created by the rotation of the Earth. Um, the fact of the matter is, we are both, the Earth is rotating counterclockwise and the Moon is orbiting around us counterclockwise. An example of that, why you see it go backwards, if you're driving down the road in your car and you're passing a jogger, well the jogger's jogging the same direction too, but he's going slower and you're going faster and you're passing him. Well as you pass him, you notice that it appears that he's going backwards as you pass him because you're going faster. Well it's the same concept with, with the, the moon, as you see it rise, rise in the east and set in the west. Um, so what happens to fix this during an eclipse that we see the real motion of the moon as it orbits around the earth? What happens with that? Um, the answer is, is that we are the moon is traveling much faster than the earth is rotating. So the, the earth is out here, and it's this little speck down here, a little spot. And the, earth, the moon is, is rotating really fast. So it's going this great distance in, a, in 28, roughly 28 days. So that means it's going really, really, really fast. And so here's the earth, real little right here, and it's going really fast. So as you can see, it doesn't take it very long at all to cover that little distance in the sky. So when the shadow's there, when we are in a line with an eclipse, we can see that because now we have this shadow there that points this out to us. And as it moves by, as it zips by the earth, you can see the shadow move from west to east. And that's when the true motion of the moon around the earth becomes apparent. And we're not fooled anymore. Um, we know. So maybe this animation will help a little bit. Another nice NASA animation here. You see, it's moving to the Earth. You can see the, this is for the 2017 eclipse here. Notice the rotations. We're rotating counterclockwise. Watch the curve of the red. It's curving down. It's projecting onto a sphere. And the shape of that shadow is also changing. See, GD, GE, right there. Perfect sphere. And it's going to come out here. It's going to fall off the edge. And it's going to turn into an ellipse. Yeah, and there it goes. Okay, hope that made it a little bit clearer there. Um, okay. Okay, so, um, some more questions about the 2017 map in particular. What happens as one moves away from that red center line? Okay, so we're going to take a look at the map again. And I'm going to go to St. Joe's. Okay, where are we? Kansas City, there we go. St. Joe's, St. Joseph's, okay. So we're going to drop a pin there. So now we're on the center line. And it, just like in that last animation, the sun's, di or sun, the moon's, shadow is moving along this line and so there's a circle here, a circle along this path. And so in the middle when you're in the center line you get the fattest part of that circle. So you get the, ma the, the maximum uh, duration of the eclipse. You get a very long eclipse at the center line. As you move out, so we had 2 minutes 38.3 seconds there. You move out, we got 2 minutes 17 seconds there. So you're getting a smaller slice of that, of that circle. Move out some more, 1 minute 15. And when you're on the very edge, 
you get 8.2 seconds or less. Uh, so it affects the, the amount of time. You will still see 100% uh, obscuration. You'll still see a total solar eclipse. You just won't see as much or as long of, of time under totality. So you are wanting to see uh, St. Joe's, and I'll open that up again here. Yeah, that's it right there. Okay, so here's all the information for St. Joseph's, or St. Joseph, Missouri. Um, maximum duration of two minutes, 38.3 seconds. That's pretty good. Um, start of the eclipse, it's got all the times here. Contact one, that's when it first starts. Contact two is the start of the total eclipse. Maximum eclipse here, that's when maximum totality occurs. Uh, contact three, C3 is the end of the total eclipse and then C4 is into the partial eclipse. So you, of course you'll have the partial and then you'll have the total. So it gives you the times for all of those and 100% obscuration there. So that's definitely a total solar eclipse. And if you guys want to see this again when I'm done, um, I can open up again um, if we have time. Okay, what determines the width of the path of totality? Well, there's a couple things. Uh, the main thing being um, how close the shadow is to Earth. Of course, if the moon is, is perfectly at perigee at that moment and you have the maximum um, size of that shadow, you're going to have a wider path. Also, what contributes to that is whether the sun in its elliptical orbit is either close, close to us or further away. If it's further away, you have less sun to cover and you'll have a longer, a longer eclipse and a greater width of totality. So a couple things there. Okay, and I have a little animation here um, that's kind of interesting. Uh, insulation, not like in your attic, but insulation is the amount of total sunlight uh, projected down on Earth. And this is during the eclipse, uh, the 2017 eclipse. These are all calculated values, but this is roughly what it'll be like. You can see is the, the blue is that it's dark. Uh, black, of course, is dark. And you can see as it moves down, and that shadow changes shape. I like that. Total sunlight. It's pretty dark there. And it takes a while to get back to uh, full brightness, too. Insulation. Okay. Okay, I'm going to move into some, a few fun things here to talk about, um, not so much technical stuff anymore. Uh, total solar eclipses through history, and these are some um, newspaper cutouts from 1918, uh, 99 years ago. And I like this one here, eclipse phenomenon viewed by thousands. One of the largest cloud, uh, crowds ever seen in Alliance, Nebraska, Saturday, viewed the eclipse of the sun. All those that did not have smoked glasses grabbed the ones held by someone else, no matter whether they knew them or not. <laughs> The event was interesting from every standpoint. This eclipse will not occur again for 99 years. The next eclipse occurring in 2017. And this one down here, next total eclipse in 2017. That's from Topeka, Kansas, I believe. And that one's from uh, Denver. So living through history, uh, 2017. Longest recorded total solar eclipse. Uh, June 15th, 744 BC, with a GD, a greatest duration of 7 minutes 28 seconds. That's one heck of an eclipse. Longest theoretically possible for a total solar eclipse is 7 minutes 32 seconds. So they missed it by 4 seconds. That's a pretty, pretty good eclipse. Next long uh, GD, greatest duration, total eclipse. Uh, July 16th, 2186. We probably won't be here then. Uh, greatest duration of 7 minutes, 29 seconds. So that's even better by a second. Uh, so, all right. Ah, and those of you who know me know I like airplanes. So I had to find some way to slip an airplane into this, this presentation here. In 1973, astronomers managed to get, it was actually the very first Concorde, serial number 001. Uh, they attempted to race the total solar eclipse. The Concorde can go very, very fast. Um, they were racing the shadow. They were traveling at, at Mach 2.05 at one time. Uh, 
in excess of speeds uh, over 1,500 miles an hour. They logged a whopping 74 minutes of totality uh, from 56,000 feet up. And uh, you, they outfitted the Concorde with all kinds of, of optical instruments uh, so they could study the corona, because from way up here, you're out of the muck of the atmosphere. And you've got all this time to observe it. Um, they got a lot of good data out of it, from what I understand. Here's a, a picture of them with all their, their equipment here back in 1973. Okay, in 1999, three more, three more Concords were used for tourist views of uh, total solar eclipse uh, before the, the program was, was done away with. Um, okay, and down here we've got a really cool picture. It's a shadow of the moon from the Mir space station during the August 11th, 1999 total solar eclipse, the same one that's mentioned up there. Really beautiful view of the the shadow of the moon during an eclipse on the Earth, an actual photo, so I thought that was really cool. Anyway, I'll show this just for a minute. This is a, it's a movie of, of a total solar eclipse here. And it's got this really creepy music to it. I'm sorry, it's like somebody fell asleep on the organ. I'll let the guys talk about more about what you're seeing up there. It's, this just kind of goes on and on. But I just wanted to show, you know, in, in a kind of a real-time uh, scenario here, what it looks like. Oh, it's awful. I mean, all the good pieces they could have picked for... Oh, really? Okay. It's not my thing, but... It goes on for about five minutes, so it gets a little old. Beautiful view here, though. Really nice corona, some prominence is there. It's going to be really cool. I hope everyone, most of you, get to make it out to totality. Okay. So, lastly, advice from a solar eclipse see the total picture, be moved by beauty, live in the moment, be naturally phenomenal, and lighten up. And that's all I got.